Welcome everyone. Good afternoon, good morning. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome you today for this webinar on COVID-19 and child labor. And we are very lucky to have um, a very experienced uh, panel today who will be able to talk with us about child labor. Great, so today's agenda, we will have the pleasure to have uh, an introduction from donor perspective on child labor and COVID-19. And then we will have uh, two field um, presentation, one about child labor in Lebanon on integration of child protection and cash transfer programming and its adaptations to COVID-19. And then another one on partnership against child exploitation known as PACE in DRC Ethiopia and CAR with a focus on uh, the impact of COVID-19 projects and research adaptation. Then we will present and introduce the COVID-19 and child labor guidance, which has been developed uh, under the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. And it is an annex to the technical note to protect children during the coronavirus pandemic. Then we will have the pleasure to get an overview of the child labor in emergency toolkit, its process, its content, including infectious disease and next step. And we are very pleased to welcome Monica, um, who is the uh, child protection technical advisor for Save the Children in Lebanon. She has 15 years experience working on strengthening child protection system, as well as provision of humanitarian response to vulnerable population, including refugees, displaced and children on the move. Uh, Monica, we are very happy to welcome you and please the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Audrey, Sylvia, Simon, and all the rest. I'm very, very pleased to, that you get, have given us the opportunity to be here today. Apologize, uh, as I cannot have my camera on. I know that that's not ideal, but uh, the connection, I think, it wouldn't allow it. Uh, but yeah, so um, I will be telling you today about um, this particular um, program that we have on child labor, which integrates in a very nice way, we believe, child protection and livelihood interventions um, to provide children engaged in child labor and worse forms on child labor and their families with a holistic response that we all know it's, uh, is uh, paramount. And then I will also move into discussing some of the programmatic adaptations that we have carried out um, to be able to be uh, better responding to COVID-19. Um, so I will just give a brief, intro brief introduction to the Lebanon cost context and uh, we'll look at, uh, yeah, okay, that's fine, that's okay. Um, so as you might know, some of you might already know, Lebanon since October uh, last year has been going through a devastating economic crisis as well as uh, political instability, which obviously compounded with the current COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated pre-existing vulnerabilities, um, pushed families into extreme poverty. I mean, it's quite alarming now we think that 40, the estimation is that 40% of Lebanon is living below poverty threshold and especially this is um, even more um, pressing for other populations like uh, Palestinians and, and Syrian refugees. Um, this obviously has also increased the number of child protection concerns. We have seen a lot of increase on violence, physical, emotional, sexual violence, uh, gender-based violence that children are, are, are suffering from, as well as other negative coping mechanisms, including obviously um, well, child marriage, but also child labor as the topic today. Um, so this situation has created further economic necessity for children to support their families. And we know that a lot of families rely on their children to be the ones that are providing for basic needs as rent and, and food. So this is the situation that we were already in and has only been exacerbated by the current pandemic. Right, so the program I wanted to tell you about today, uh, it has started before COVID-19, so we started last year, and it specifically targeted children, but as well as adolescents, which we believe, again, that is an age group that often is 
um, a bit neglected in our programming, so we make the specific point of working with them uh, that are living in Beirut and around Beirut. Um, and with, it focuses in those specifically engaged in worst forms of child labor and children with disabilities, but of course, we also be responding to any other child protection vulnerabilities. Uh, as mentioned, integrate child protection and livelihoods under the premise that obviously, for an any successful address child labor in the long term and in a sustainable manner, uh, we are we are to address the root causes like poverty and lack of income. I'll give you a little bit of uh, the, the points that we do in child protection and livelihoods and, and so that you can understand better how the program goes. So for child protection, we do case management where children in worst forms of child labor are identified and get through the whole circle of case management, which of course I'm not gonna go into because you all know. They also receive PSS support and they also receive when eligible cash for child labor, we have called it that way. And I'll park that there and I will come back to it because this is the point that I wanna emphasize because it's quite um, interesting, I, I think. Um, from the livelihood side, uh, families receive livelihood counseling to see what are their uh, main preference according to labor markets and market-based skills training for adults or older youth in the family. So it's not only for parents and caregivers, but also it can be an older sibling or someone like a, a youth that is living in the household of the child that is engaged in worst forms of child labor. And this is basically to equip, equip them with the skills to pursue stable livelihood opportunities and then therefore be less dependent on the labor of the child as the main income generator. Um, so these are the two main pillars. And then we have this innovative piece, which is that uh, families that are under case management, of course, if this is all uh, compounded by check, uh, case management will also receive a fixed amount of cash to ensure that households are able to maintain the gap in income once the child stops working. So this is this cash for protection for child labor and uh, that we are granted to, to families. Um, uh, when this money is given and whether this money is given to the family and the amount given to the family, um, it's a big, uh, complicated, so I won't go into the details as such, but basically we have created a quite comprehensive, I'm, I'm really happy with the, the selection tool, um, that tell us uh, we are able to, to understand what's the situation of the child and will we consider many criteria like the type of work that the child is doing, the working hours, the risk of injury at work, whether the job is preventing the child from education, um, depending on the child income, also we'll have into account, for example, the household composition, the household arrangement, whether it's a, a female head of household, is a disability in the house, etc. Et so this tool will give us a score which may, will uh, make the child and the family eligible to receive this benefit. And the amount, it will be determined on whether or not the family is receiving other support or other assistance from UNHCR or other um, uh, yeah, humanitarian actors, but I will go not go into the detail now because it's, it's a little bit complex and I believe we don't have much time, but by all means, um, you can reach out to me if you need to leave no more details. I wanted to tell you a little bit of the findings and outputs that we have seen in the phase out of the, the first phase of the project. So since we started last year, we've seen a total of uh, 109 children that have been identified at risk you know, since October. As you can see, most of them are males and we are working really hard on also increasing our mechanisms to identify and outreach girls, but it's, all, it's often uh, yeah, a bit more difficult because the work that they do is more hidden, more household related. Uh, 96 of these children are identified at risk of child as involved in child labor and four of 4% that have other protection concerns. Um, so prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, 29 of the children that were under our program start working, stopped working, sorry, and others transition into more decent work, which is also part of the uh, purpose of the program. Uh, the trends that we've been witnessing since the pandemic started, um, uh, it's important to remark that at the beginning, we saw a drastic decrease on the number of children that they were uh, working for the first few weeks um, because the lockdown and the government restrictions. But then again, as this the, the lockdown and the, the restrictions will continue, but the economic pressure was higher and higher and increasing. So children returning to the streets and returning to, to work. And most of them, at least the ones that we see working on the street, are not wearing any protective equipment, not masks, no gloves, anything. So this is also obviously a concern for their health and safety. Um, 
but um, so yeah, during COVID-19, 82% of the children who were involved in child labor stopped working. Uh, I said that before, but then we, we have seen the, the increase again um, due to that economic pressure. I wanted to give you a little bit of the challenges that we have uh, faced. Um, I mean, there are the external challenges that obviously are very difficult to control, as I was saying before, the, the, the demonstrations against the government, the political turmoil, the deterioration of the national currency, uh, child labor restriction, uh, restrictions sorry, that were set by the government to uh, refugees, to non-Lebanese, so all these are like um, structural institutional problems that are obviously uh, posing a challenge also for our program. But most, but those that are related to COVID um, have been uh, mainly focused around um, identifying these children because uh, again, we have also been less able to be out there and, and, and to, to be present on the field. So it was more difficult to, to, to go and, and, and identify and, and see that where the children were and in which, under which conditions. Uh, we also have seen an increase in vulnerabilities and needs for across populations. So uh, at the country level, challenge to comprehensively reach all the families that they were seeking for support because um, the level of, of poverty and, and need is, is increasing. So more families, uh, are researching to, to, to have to use child labor to, to basically survive. And we have also seen an increase on the children involved in child labor, as I was saying before. Um, and even more now, as the government restriction that is in up, children are, are, are going back to the fields and going back to the, to the streets. Um, I have at the bottom, I don't know if you can see it, but at the bottom I have created a hyperlink to um, a child labor policy brief paper that we developed at the Save the Children uh, Lebanon, outlining, outlining, outlining sorry, our recommendations on how to integrate programming for child labor during, during and after COVID-19. And again, it's all integrated responses on child protection, education, as well as, as livelihoods. So again, if anyone would be interested to, to see that, I would be happy to, to share. Um, and then if we move to the next slide, um, in terms of the challenges, well, the challenges I already mentioned, but in terms of the adaptations that we have uh, trying to, to do, oh, yeah, that one. Um, we have, I mean, it has changed a little bit since I last sent the presentation, but basically what we had created in the first place uh, is that we developed very early on into the process um, case management and PSS remote guidance for case workers. So basically say the children here call it the case management task force and is a core member of the child protection working group. So very early on in the process, we develop a very comprehensive set of tools that was to guide our case workers on how to continue to work with children, even though we were not able to be physically present. So it's a hybrid model in which we are still uh, using obviously all the equipment and necessary protection measures. We still go and see the high, high risk cases but for others that we already know the family and the context, we continue to do remote case management, uh, which is proving also a bit sometimes challenging, but, but it's also a very uh, interesting way of reaching um, children and families. Uh, and again, this uh, is a, a very comprehensive set of tools and I would be happy to share if anyone is interested. Um, we have also tried to, we're still working, but it's almost finalized, modifying the recommendation for the use of ICA, emergency, um, a cash assistant, which is a very um, a small amount of money that we give to families and it's one off and it's used just to like cover basic needs or if the child needs to go to the doctor or needs to buy new clothes, etc, etc. So we're modifying this pro these SOPs to make them more flexible and to be able to cover other needs that the families are having at the moment that perhaps were different before the pandemic. We have also shifted all our livelihood activities, um, have been temporarily substituted by multipurpose cash assistant because we realized that perhaps at the moment it's not the best time for families to be able to go through a path to um, apprehensive um, uh, sorry to um, uh, library training or like skill based training because you know these centers are closed and because there's not much going on in terms of jobs and what people really need at the moment is cash to be able to pay the rent and, and buy food and basic items so we have shifted 
temporarily and as an as a adaptation modality for COVID, all the livelihood programming to multi-purpose cash, and then we will resume uh, hopefully after this is over. And we have also we're also providing additional in-kind assistance for children and caregivers that might are under isolation conditions. So this is composed by different items, food parcels, IPC kits, as well as happy kit kit. We have called it, which is a um, a sort of PSS and recreational kit uh, that is um, distributed to families and children to help them to cope with the daily stress of the lockdown, etc. Et um, and I think this is it from me. Thank you, Monica. Uh, thank you for your flexibility and, and starting that, that webinar on, on a such great presentation about the situation in, in Lebanon. Uh, Quite worrying. I mean, you, as you have mentioned already, you have seen an increase of uh, child labor uh, while you are still dealing with uh, COVID-19 uh, response, and as well as an augmentation of the vulnerability of the population. So there, there is actually like um, it's a good reason to be worried and start thinking how we could respond to to child labor. I have the great pleasure to welcome. Catherine Shinnock, who is a Senior International Relations Officer in the U.S. Department of Child Labor. Uh, for the past 13 years, uh, Catherine Shinnock has worked in the Latin American and Caribbean Division, providing support to technical assistance um, cooperation in the region. And previously, she worked as the Researcher Associate uh, with the John Hopkins University Center for Civil Society Studies analyzing the impact of the nonprofit sector around the world. She also served, uh, served as a Peace Corps volunteer for two years in Nicaragua and worked as a chief of staff for a former US ambassador. We are very pleased to have you on board and the floor is yours, uh, Catherine. The focus of this year's World Day Against Child Labor, Children in Crisis could not be more relevant as the world continues to grapple with realities of the global COVID-19 pandemic and children who continue to search for a way forward in these difficult times. The global crisis has changed the way we look at the world. It demands that we approach the problem of child labor with increased urgency, with new ideas, and with a renewed willingness to work together toward a common goal. We recognize that the children in greatest need are the children at greatest risk of exploitation during these times. So I would like to provide a very brief overview about how the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Child Labor, Forced Labor, and Human Trafficking works to end labor abuses. Our work centers on three main areas. We conduct research and reporting on the scope and nature of labor abuses in countries around the world to inform U.S. foreign policy, trade policy, and cooperation initiatives. We engage with governments, civil society, and businesses to ensure that each does their part to level the playing field. And we support innovative technical assistance cooperation strategies that build the capacity of governments and civil society organizations to eliminate child and forced labor. I would like to highlight two apps that our office has developed that assist in raising awareness about these issues. Our Sweat and Toil app enables access to thousands of pages of research from our reports right in the palm of your hand. Our Comply Chain app provides companies and industry groups with practical guidance to develop robust social compliance plans. Information about both of these apps and how to download them is available on our website. For over 25 years, the Department of Labor has been engaging on these issues with various partners and stakeholders around the globe. We have learned a great deal about the challenges involved in providing assistance to children in crisis, particularly those in the worst forms of child labor, at the center of armed conflict, impacted by earthquakes and tsunamis, moving through Ebola and now through COVID-19. The pandemic is affecting everyone, but vulnerable communities around the world are at greater risk of exploitation and, and abuse due to several factors, such as those outlined in the Alliance's technical note on COVID-19. The loss of jobs and household income, food insecurity, and family, and family illness may lead to children to work to help families meet basic needs. School closures are also leaving more children in the home and families desperate for income are likely to put their children to work. 
Increased domestic violence during the crisis may, may cause children to run away from home, increasing their vulnerability to exploitation, particularly in the commercial sex industry. Decreased monitoring and workplace inspections and a lack of social protection programs are also likely to increase child labor and other forms of exploitation. In the face of these challenges, we all need to do our part. I would like to share with you an example of how one of our projects we are funding is adapting to this crisis. In Paraguay, Partners of the Americas implements the USDO-funded Paraguay Ocacua project to address child and forced labor in the Paraguayan Chaco region. In response to the pandemic, the project has launched a communications campaign on COVID-19 in which it is using SMS text messaging and radio-based public service announcements to disseminate information on self-care, recognizing COVID-19 symptoms, and what to do if these symptoms are identified among workers. The project is collaborating with local journalists who have volunteered to translate messages into indigenous languages to reach even more vulnerable groups. The Paraguay Ocacua project is also educating employers and workers in Paraguay about government assistance programs available to those impacted by the crisis. Additionally, the project continues to work in close collaboration with the Paraguayan Ministry of Labor to ensure that labor inspectors have the tools and training that are needed to address child labor, which is especially important during the current crisis as more children are vulnerable to exploitation. Most of our projects are rising to this challenge and more examples are provided on our website. And our website also includes a World Day Against Child Labor message from our Deputy Undersecretary of International Affairs, Martha Newton. In the face of the global challenge created by the coronavirus pandemic, we all need to do our part to ensure that children in need do not fall through the cracks. It is our responsibility to protect the welfare of these children and to help vulnerable families through this difficult period. It is unacceptable for children to be entering into exploitative work in order to help families meet basic needs. We cannot allow there to be a lost generation of children who miss out on schooling and training opportunities that would be a crisis for these children, for their communities, and for future generations. By calling attention to this crisis and working together, we can make a difference. We can and we should do more. And we can start by reaching out to one another, learning from one another, and working together to support children and families in need. Thank you once again to the organizers of this event for bringing us together. And thank you everyone for your commitment to creating a world free from child labor. Thank you. And thank you so much, Catherine, for being here with us today, as well as for your inspiring words. And yes, uh, we should do that together and we could do more together. So thank you for that. I will now have the pleasure to um, welcome Christine Barrett, uh, Program Manager for World Vision UK, uh, Nando Gergili, apology if I mispronounce your name, uh, the representative uh, from World Child UK, um, and Cécile Fonton Danton, uh, representative from Columbia University CPC Learning Network who will be presenting now the uh, PACE Consortium in DRC, Ethiopia and CARE. Uh, so please, Christine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Audrey. Um, thanks very much for inviting uh, us um, and my colleagues from, from PACE to, to, this, um, to this day. So um, you've asked us to, to uh, come and speak a bit about the consortium um, and the work that we're doing. So, if you you can have a look afterwards if you want to google pace consortium there's a really nice website with lots of pictures and, and lots of information um that um about us is, is on there which you can look at in in more time so that's so that you should be able to just google pace consortium and it will come up um so yeah so we wanted to introduce um this is a um a project that's been implemented for eight months we had a year of co-creation it's a DFID funded uh, department for international development in the UK have funded us um, and the the aim of the project is to find a, uh, effective approaches in ending the worst forms of child labor 
Um, and as Audrey said in the introduction, this is in three African countries. Now, uh, these ones are Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, and Ethiopia. These are all considered fragile states um, where it's the most difficult for a child to grow up. Um, and we, we're not aware of very much um, that's known about how to work in, in fragile states with child labor. Um, and so there's an underlying uh, research element to the project, um, which my colleague Cecile will be, would, will be talking about later. But um, the aim of the project, we, we, we split into four uh, outcomes. Um, one is to strengthen child's, children's agency uh, and that of the communities that they live in. Um, to help families um, and, their, um, and the children to, um, to support and access suitable alternatives. That may be school or it may be training or vocational um, activities. Um, we're also um, supporting um, policymakers, law enforcement and the justice professionals to investigate and prosecute against the, the laws it, that generally do exist to protect the children in these countries. Um, um, but there needs to be more, more beef into that, more, more sort of strength in that. Um, and finally, um, the fourth outcome is a um, really exciting one where we're mapping the private sector supply chains uh, and also working with businesses to strengthen their due diligence. So there's a lot of different themes in the systems approach. We've, uh, we've got a consortium of very diverse um, organizations which you can you can see see there a couple of very niche small organizations but they're incredibly active and powerful in the consortium um, so yeah as i said look on the website you can see more about us so for covid um, particularly wanted to look at covid adaptations um, so our immediate um, our immediate work once the uh, the pandemic became apparent was um, staff safety we're uh, paramount was do no harm in the communities that we worked in. We didn't want to travel it in or anyone to travel into those communities and take potentially take COVID in there. International travel and local travel was suspended pretty much before the um, before the governments had put things in place. We didn't want anyone to get stuck there. Um, so the um, the short term actions were um, to we asked for all of our um, field offices to give us re regular weekly updates on what was happening because the situation was happening so uh, was changing so quickly and what was happening in each country was so different so we we got that information to enable us to monitor um, we actually went pretty much in central african republic to using some of the um, some of the groups that we already had arranged to um, sensitize and to give hygiene kits and then slightly longer term, we just um, completed the um, replanning scenario replanning. Um, we've adapted some ongoing work on labor market assessments, which looked at supply chains and alternative vocational uh, um, opportunities. Um, they were uh, they were um, tweaked and, and pivoted, so they included the, the pandemic uh, and the effect of it. Anecdotal evidence was uh, collected from field offices and data where possible uh, and activities that had stopped initially, gradually some of them were able to rework them with smaller groups, with visiting households rather than groups. And long term, we've rethought uh, the research questions which, which are driving the, um, the, the four year project, we're, we're in year two, um, and um, some activities we have had to to stop, there are some somewhere we just need the skill of those partners, and if they can't move move into the country to do training, etc., then um, we'd, we'd, we're we're waiting. Excellent. So uh, thanks everyone for having us on the line. I'm going to be very brief. So Warchild, as a part of this consortium, works in the Central African Republic and the DRC, and the project adaptations that we've had to do uh, to reflect the COVID-19 context very much sort of mirror what Christine just told you. So we have had some delays in the start of some of the pilot activities that we're running as a part of this project. And I don't have the time to go de into these into detail, but they're basically youth advocacy groups. We have positive parenting, positive parenting discussion groups, sorry. And then we have things that uh, in CAR, we have multi-service employment hubs and in the DRC school gardens. Um, 
So many of these activities were, of course, immediately impacted by COVID-19. And the first thing that needed to be done was to adapt these activities to social distancing and to government guidance, which was, was in, issued in both countries so that they could continue uh, in sort of an adapted smaller format. So group discussions, the group sizes had to be downsized so that they could continue, uh, which meant more di group discussions, which incidentally is driving up uh, the costs of carrying out the project activities. The voice more, so youth advocacy and the parenting groups were equipped with hand washing facilities and hygiene kits and they were trained to sensitize their peers on preventing COVID-19. So these were very much sort of immediate adaptations in the, in the last few months. In Central African Republic specifically, we work community-based child protection volunteer networks, the so-called RECOPE, as you see on the slides here. So these were also trained on COVID-19 prevention and uh, they were briefed on the increased child protection risk that COVID-19 represents in the current context. Uh, we've had to put in place new networks in a couple of mining areas where evidence is starting to emerge that COVID-19 has actually worsened the situation for children, uh, by which I mean that more children have been sort of recruited uh, to work in mining areas. Uh, also in Central African Republic, we identified 12 so-called role model families who were equipped with hygiene kits and trained to sensitize their neighborhoods once again on COVID-19. And this is something that was planned uh, in the next phase of the project in the second half of the year, but we had to advance it uh, a little bit in, this, uh, in light of the circumstances in the high risk area. And then from the DRC, one of the interesting adaptations is uh, some changes in approaches. So instead of mass awareness raising through gatherings, which are now of course banned, we've had to adapt door to door awareness raising. And in some cases, this was not possible because it would have been too costly. Uh, and as a result, unfortunately, community ownership of the project uh, has somewhat decreased, which is again, driving up some of the project costs. And because this is ongoing, uh, so very much like what Christine just said, we are aware that we need to look at our work plan, that we need to look at the project targets, possibly reduce them so that they remain achievable under COVID-19. And in the medium term, this revision of the work plan and of the targets is it's currently ongoing. So this is just in a nutshell how uh, project activities are adapted very, very much in the detail to these new realities. I'll hand over now to uh, Cecile for the research part. We've run some uh, data collection to see uh, what was going on on the, on the field um, following the COVID-19 crisis and to be able to inform you of it. Um, the development of the project. Uh, initial findings are that the economic situation has worsened and uh, the, for, because of price inflation and um, loss of income. Uh, and the two together uh, like already led to uh, some food insecurity with many people saying that coping strategy involve uh, a reduced uh, food intake. Uh, children have massively engaged in agriculture everywhere in our field of activity. Um, in the mining sector, uh, as Nandor say, most of our indicators says that more children are going and this is also because um, the prices of mineral have decreased due to the border closure in many places. In some places though, some social distancing rule have been applied in mines and uh, therefore had um, so like prevented children from coming in for a little time and we don't know how long this will last. Um, if we look at that through a gender lens, we see that um, girls are paying a higher price of this crisis because they're um, involved in uh, household cores on top of uh, working more. And they're also um, like already indication of uh, a higher sexual exploitation of young girls around mine sites and uh, in city centers. Um, we also observed in Ethiopia some uh, an, like an increase of uh, uh, girl uh, marriage. Um, so this is just a um, very practical example of something that happened to us and might be of interest for, for some of you. The, uh, we were in the middle of an, a big uh, randomized control trial when the, um, uh, when the lockdown was um, enforced in Ethiopia and so we had to stop and then start again that, that survey under uh, many constraints. Um, we're already over time, so I'm going to stop here, but uh, there is a brief on, on this survey and uh, 
how we managed to start again and under what condition you can actually run the survey um, in, uh, in this, condition, in this uh, current situation. So I'm inviting you to go uh, on the PACE website to find it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nando, Christine, and Cecile for that uh, presentation of this uh, consortium in DRC, um, CAR, and, and Ethiopia. And yes, please, Cecile, share with us um, the link you just mentioned. I think it's going to be very interesting as well to uh, look at how we could do those type of research in certain circumstances. I will now invite Silvia Onate, uh, who is the Child Protection Specialist in Emergency with Plan International Global Team, as well as the co-chair of the uh, Child Labor Task Force under the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. And Silvia is going to present uh, the uh, technical note on COVID-19 and child labor. I'm going to briefly present the child labor and COVID-19 guidance that the Child Labor Task Force put together when COVID-19 started. We realized like sometimes uh, child labor risks are invisible and not identified as critical. Uh, so we realized as it says an imminent concern uh, that we wanted to put together some uh, short guidance, global guidance can be contextualized and adapted and being based on the evidence that we have gathered from humanitarian, from previous humanitarian crises, but also from lessons learned from disease outbreak responses and some of the experiences that we had started to see uh, from COVID-19, um, knowing that the huge impact on the economics, but also the closure of the schools widely, would have like likely an uh, increase in the prevalence of child labor. So we thought that it was very important to highlight what are the, some of the risks, but also some of the potential actions uh, and provide some support uh, to the um, policymakers, but also the practitioners, uh, practitioners working on child labor. So we use uh, our main uh, references where child protection minimum standards, the child labor minimum standard, but also the child labor and emergencies toolkit uh, that will be presented after uh, my presentation. Um, so we're very in line, the, the actions included and the risk identified were also in line uh, with these two core pieces for us. Um, and then I also have to say that this is an annex to the global um, technical note to protect children from violence during COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so it's, it's also complementing um, the technical note uh, from the Alliance uh, for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. I want to uh, quickly um, go through what is the content and what is the structure of this guidance for those that you might not have seen it yet. So it provides like the first has like four sections. So the first section has an introduction that actually frames, uh, provides some data on like what, like the number of uh, children engaged in child labor, also uh, links to the SDG 8.7 and the opportunity next year, 2021, uh, the UN year to end child labor. So as some of my um, colleagues and previous speakers have said, um, it might be, you know, uh, this is a, like a risk to actually uh, lose all the gains that we have made, the progress that has been achieved on reducing child labor. So we set the introduction on why, uh, why it's important to actually prevent and uh, respond to child labor during COVID-19. Um, the second section is child labor in the context of COVID-19. So we identify a specific risk, uh, child labor risk, but also other related risks uh, for two different groups. For, we identified that there are the specific risk uh, for children at risk of child labor. So we can see that COVID-19 might push uh, many more children, millions of children into child labor, but also for those children that at the moment are already engaged in child labor that can be pushed into worse forms of child labor. So we have uh, in, the, in the guidance, we have you know, examples of different forms uh, of, of like, you know, different forms of violence, trafficking, uh, family separation, some of the risks that have been identified in some of the contexts, uh, 
that can be you know can be identified when you know provide like you know ident doing assessments or uh, with different practitioners looking at the specific uh, context. Uh, the third section, it's more now on the actions. I can see already a lot of questions on the chat on, um, okay, what can we do? We know like child labor is a complex issue, uh, there are different risks identified, uh, but what are they, you know, as practitioners, what can we do to prevent and respond to child labor during, during COVID-19? So the three sections identified through, like for uh, program advocacy actions, uh, three. So one, working with other sectors. So we know um, that it's important to have not only child protection, but also the sector specific interventions, but to integrate child protection in other sectors in order to holistically address child labor. So we have um, proposed some specific actions during COVID-19 to work with, uh, with our health colleagues, to work with our cash and voucher assistant colleagues with uh, food security, protection, so uh, education, for example, uh, training health workers on identification and also reporting of child labor, ensuring the wash awareness messages are child friendly, but also targeting uh, sectors and area where children are engaged in child labor so they can receive those messages. Uh, so there are several examples of, of actions working with other sectors. Uh, then we have the section on child protection specific actions. And these again are in line with the child protection minimum standards. So recognizing that we have to continue working on case management, on community level child protection approaches, on uh, PSS, uh, group level activities or individual activities for child well-being. Uh, alternative care, and then those adaptations specifically during COVID-19. Um, and then for this section, we identify as well that different countries have, are in different stages, so might have in the initial part of the response, uh, in during the main uh, response, or even beyond, like, you know, in the recovery phase of COVID-19. So it's important to see also like the linkages with other, you know, other actors and stakeholders. And finally, uh, working with governance. So the, the guidance also provide um, specific advocacy messages, uh, like the provision of uh, continuation of education, of alternative education to ensure uh, education doesn't stop, uh, to work together with school strengthening monitoring systems. Um, other examples of like provision of job, job employment or youth employment uh, for families. Uh, so there's different actions also and advocacy messages uh, identified included in the guidance. And the last section of the guidance are like resources. So we mentioned here uh, our core resources, the Child Protection Minimum Standards, the Child Labor Emergency Toolkit, our Alliance website and the Child Labor Task Force but also more importantly, the field examples. So uh, I want to highlight as well, like uh, a lot of the, um, the, the examples that, we, that we've been based uh, our, uh, our experience and promoting the, um, the evidence is using the field examples. So we continue to map and identify what, what has been the impact of COVID-19 on child labor, but also what has been the program ad adaptations and then how different organizations responding and preventing uh, child labor can you know can contribute and we are like uh, you, like mapping this and you can access all the different examples uh, from the annex um, and finally i want to say that you can find the this guidance and go through, uh, you can access uh, from the website that you can see on the screen, and it's already available in French, in Spanish, um, and also like in Myanmar. And if you are also interested in uh, translating into any other languages, you can also get in touch with the Child Labor Task Force. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Sylvia. As you can see, everyone, uh, there is a COVID-19 tab under the, the Alliance website where you will be able to find all the resources that have been developed, including the child labor uh, notes. You will have access as well to um, all the uh, recording webinars. Um, and, and then as well, putting in back here, uh, the uh, podcast protected with the latest episode 
um, on child labor that was released today on the World Day Against Child Labor. I will now welcome Alison Enon, sorry if I mispronounce your name, Alison, uh, who is a senior child protection and humanitarian consultant at Dickling Lead in the development of the child protection uh, of the Child Labour in Emergency Toolkit. Uh, she has been therefore a very active member of the uh, Child Labour Task Force. Alison, the floor is yours and we are very happy to have you today. So the Child Labour Toolkit has been an ongoing and uh, extensive project which many of you on the call have been involved in, with. We are coming to the end stages of it now, unfortunately um, COVID has delayed us by a few months, but we will um, get there over the summer. Just to give you kind of an update on where we're at in the process so far. So we had a field tested version that was developed um, it was released in 2017 and, and that was kind of developed off the back of extensive cons consultation um, uh, and experience from organizations within the Alliance for Child Protection uh, in Humanitarian Action. In 2017, we started kind of a more structured field test um, with plan um, and it was paired with kind of remote and in-country technical support. Um, we visited a lot of countries, we worked with a lot of countries um, at distance, um, and we kind of looked at then revising all the content. We conducted a big survey and held a lot of, a lot of interviews. Um, and, and we also worked very closely with uh, UNICEF in Turkey. That was a big kind of interagency project that we worked on between the task force and uh, interagency coordination child labor group in Turkey. That with a regional Middle East consultation, Middle East and North Africa consultation, really kind of um, brought a lot of experience and case studies into um, the revision of the toolkit. So we've developed a lot of new case studies off the back of um, a lot of the interviews and work that we did in country. Um, we've developed a lot of new tools and kind of recognition that there was more content um, to deal with. Uh, we have, um, it's child labor is obviously not an easy topic to take on and and put into a short concise uh document <laughs> so we've tried to put it put the guidance into really user-friendly interactive tools and case studies um that kind of revision process took was throughout 2018 and 2019 and then we did an interagency technical review which started kind of at the end of 2019 and went through to um, February this year. All the changes have been kind of incorporated and continue to be finalized before um, uh, a kind of red flag revision in the next in the coming few months and then we will look to I can't, I'm afraid I can't see the end of my screen here um yeah so it will we will be incorporating kind of um final last minute changes over the next few months and we will be looking to um uh, deliver it and launch it later in um the summer kind of uh october um autumn sorry <laughs> i forgot the word there so what are some of the significant changes that um, we'll see in the new toolkit? We have a shorter main document. One of the big things that, like I said, has been length. Um, there were a lot of kind of requests to add in content, but without kind of trying to make it ma manageable. So we've got a shorter main document with lots of interlinkages. All of the tools and case studies will be annexed, but will be um, clickable uh, through interactivity. It's obviously an interactive toolkit. Um, we have a much stronger prevention lens. It's, it's kind of mainstream throughout the whole thing, obviously, but we also have specific sections on preventing child labor associated with uh, humanitarian action. And there's a, 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 strong, a section on prevention as well um, in the toolkit. Like I said, we've integrated and annexed the tools to try and make it quite, to make it more manageable. We've taken, in the last draft, we, um, uh, we had the, t the kind of program considerations and the frontline worker guidance sat side by side. We've, we've t taken the frontline worker guidance and turned it into more practical tools that can just be given to um, workers, hopefully, or adapted in country to more practical tools. Um, so we really focused the toolkit on kind of supporting program design and implementation. 
We um, have brought in new content around case management, differentiated responses, um, health, cash programming, uh, a variety of kind of like food security and livelihoods program options, taking account of the fact that addressing child labour in agriculture can be very different to addressing child labour in services. Um, we've restructured it around the child protection minimum standard revision process, so it now mirrors in places um, the structure of the child protection minimum standards. Uh, we, we previously had kind of integrated uh, early childhood development and technical vocational education and training, but these are now kind of separate sections on their own and we've obviously introduced a section to reflect COVID-19 and, and epidemics. Obviously the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of the toolkit was developed before COVID-19 happens but we obviously link to the a lot of the guidance that's been written um, since COVID-19 has hit and uh, we have a kind of a section to address it. We didn't want to, given the late stage of where we were in producing the guidance, completely rewrite it to reflect COVID-19, um, rather that we add in content and make it uh, interlinking and um, easily accessible to find the most relevant COVID-19 guidance, because obviously that will also change over the course of the year. We've also tried to streamline the guidance in terms of uh, bringing content together. So things like monitoring and preparedness and communications and advocacy. So the content is, um, has been brought together more cohesively under um, four clear sections. So like I said, we've got four clear sections in the, in the toolkit. One is the introduction, kind of all of the um, how to use the toolkit, what are the key concepts around legal framework, uh, what's appropriate and safe work for children of you know, which age, um, how do we use the legal framework, that kind of thing. Section two is kind of all of the components that we need to develop a, a quality response. So it looks at coordination, needs assessment and analysis, and within that a kind of like defining our information needs, conducting secondary data re review and uh, conducting primary data collection um, and then the third chapter is really kind of the meat of and all the bones and it's sector specific at this point not all of it's sector specific but it is where you find the sector specific guidance um, around child protection education food security and livelihoods health um, early childhood development that kind of thing but it also has kind of program actions around emergency preparedness preventing child labor um, child labour associated with a humanitarian response, but also preventing child labour in the beginning stages of, of a rapid onset. Um, we also kind of have a section on programmatic framework and that, so this is all the kind of programmatic actions of the, the meat on the bones, shall we say. Um, and then the last chapter is the core implementation act activities. So there, uh, things like communication, advocacy, knowledge and capacity building, um, monitoring, that includes situation monitoring, response and program monitoring and evaluation and information management. So all of the core implementation activities. That's kind of an outline, right? Obviously it's um, an overview. <laughs> uh, but yeah, next steps are kind of, we're finalizing it over the next few months. Um, and then it will obviously go for editing and layout and that kind of thing. We will launch and roll it out from autumn 2020. Uh, and at the uh, aside to the toolkit, there's the development of capacity building package, which goes alongside that, um, as well as the kind of ordinary day-to-day uh, -day support that the child labour task force is able to provide uh, when it's when it's contacted to do so. I'm just presenting the three slides. Um, so just like three actions that you can do today for. Um, to mark the day. So after this webinar, you can join also the, you know, the ILO and UNICEF uh, high-level discussion. They've published a, a paper quite interesting as well, looking at the impact, but as well, uh, you know, some of the recommendations. Uh, as well, we want to encourage uh, all of you to visit the Child Labor Task Force um, to access all the materials and resources and then be in touch uh, if you want to be part of uh, this task force to be a member. Uh, we are, uh, it's co-chaired by ILO and Plan International, 
but we also have a representation from different NGOs and UN agencies and we our aim is to really like share experiences, knowledge and promote technical standards. So uh, we really encourage all of you to join uh, our task force and be in touch if you need any support. Uh, we will be prioritizing the launch and rollout of the toolkit uh, and also capacity building. So please be in touch. And then the last action, uh, it's on the Alliance. So as you, you know, as you have heard throughout the webinar, there's so many uh, links with the podcast, with uh, webinars like Facebook, social media. So um, you can also join and access all the information on the on the website. Great, thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Silvia. And indeed, we are encouraging you to um, to follow the alliance on our social medias. But as well, you can become a, a member of of the alliance if it's not the case. And there is the uh, COVID. 19 tab which uh, will allow you to have access to um, COVID-19 related resources that the Alliance has put together. Thank you everyone. Uh, we wish you a beautiful weekend.